we're going to crack on. We're on with this thick and fast. Uh, right now, we're going to hear from Mark Warden, who is the Strategy and Innovation Lead for Cora at NatWest, talking about a topic which is a very important topic, which I don't think many people are thinking about whatsoever, which is how to make your conversational assistance more accessible for those that have uh, either certain accessibility needs or, or physical or mental impairments. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Mark Warden. Thank you very much. I am not going to talk about large language models, so apologies to begin with. Uh, I will cycle back at the end. I'll do 10 seconds on them. Uh, I am Mark Worden. I'm the Strategy and Innovation Lead for Cora at NatWest. And today, I'm going to be running you through how we are making conversational AI accessible by design in NatWest. So, what does that mean <laughs> to begin with? So to cover this, first I'll talk through why NatWest are considering digital accessibility and what it means for us. Then I'm going to talk to you about NatWest chat. A lot of you here might not know what NatWest chat is. That's absolutely fine. I'll do a show of hands in a bit. And more specifically, I'll be talking about the lessons that we've learned from NatWest chat in regards to accessibility. And then finally, what else we're going to be looking at with regards to improving experiences for customers and their access needs. So to confuse things slightly, I'll start with a why by explaining a what. What is digital accessibility to NatWest? So digital accessibility is the outcome of making digital products accessible to everyone, ensuring all people can access the same information regardless of the impairments, disabilities, or conditions they may have. It's about frictionless digital journeys for everyone. And this is NatWest vision across all channels from Cora to the mobile app to be an accessible bank by design. So this next slide here is one of the key slides that I definitely want you to take away from this talk. This shows examples of different access needs that people could have at any one point in their lives. On the left are more permanent access needs. In this case, at the top for touch, you can see um, someone having one arm. In the center, we have what is called temporary access needs, such as uh, an arm injury. And on the right-hand side, you can see situational access needs, such as being a new parent. And for those of you here who don't have children, might be a bit confused why I've mentioned being a new parent. It's amazing how much that you need to relearn how to do with one arm when you've got a baby in the other. Um, for myself personally, I experienced this a couple of years ago, and it's kind of a godsend that I work in conversational AI, and I'm a bit obsessed with home automation. Smart speakers in every room in the house have Willow asleep on one arm and able to change the volume of the TV, change, turn lights off on and off without disturbing Willow. So the thing I like the most about this image is if you actually design with the permanent access needs in mind on the left, you're automatically designing for all the access needs on the right. So by doing that, you're making the experience better for both temporary and situational access needs. So what are the benefits of designing for accessibility? Well, from an innovation perspective, you create a growth potential from diverse ideas. From an inclusion perspective, uh, no customer is left behind. Roughly one in five people in the UK have a permanent access need. And 78% of people will develop an access need whether permanent, temporary, or situational at some point in their lives. From a productivity perspective, accessible solutions boost productivity, and around 75% of customers with a need will walk away from an inaccessible experience. And of course, there's compliance. Um, I don't need to mention consumer duty for a lot of people here, but there is compliance as well. So what standards do we look to to follow? We look towards WCAG 2.1, or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And that is not just because in that West we do love a good acronym. Uh, but these are widely known as industry standards. The slight issue being here that they don't have 
specific guidance for conversational AI assistance. So they're predominantly for web. Mobile guidance was added in 2018. 2.2 is around the corner, but it doesn't contain a lot of guidance for conversational AI. So these are more principles that we follow to try to be as accessible as possible. Which leads me on to NatWest chat. So quick show of hands, not from the guys in NatWest. <laughs> Does anyone know what NatWest chat is? That's great. That's really good. I'm happy. Um, because you're about to see something new that we've been working on. For the past year and a half, we've actually been building in-house our very own custom user interface for conversational AI. And no, I'm not trying to sell it to you today, so don't worry. Uh, but I am going to talk to you about the lessons that we've learned along the journey uh, from an accessibility perspective. So before we talk through that, a little background as to why on earth we would actually take on this pretty big challenge, which is exactly what it has been. First of all was cost. We currently use LivePerson, for those eagle-eyed among you, and they are an expensive supplier. We completed an RFI, and as part of that, our technology team actually put together a demo themselves, which brought around the second benefit, control. With LivePerson, we would often ask for an increase in functionality, like, say, a date picker, not a complex UI component, but one that would benefit, say, setting up a standing order on the right day, searching transactions in a date range, and we would find with these that it would take, and I'm not joking, years to come through. And when it did go into production, it wasn't fit for our use cases, because we're a bank and we're awkward. Uh, but it was built with other companies in mind. So we were one fish in the ocean, which leads me to the second benefit of why we considered this vision. This gives us complete control from a UI perspective on our vision and strategy for Cora going forwards. Finally, inclusivity. Live person are WCAG 2.1 AA accredited. Okay? However, when we had our annual audit for accessibility, over 100 defects, ranging from blockers to minors, were identified with LivePerson and are still outstanding now. Uh, this gives us the chance and the power to actually change that for our customers. So on to NatWest chat and the learnings that we, we have. So the first was with carousels. You can see from this complex uh, number system just how much you definitely need to take into account uh, in terms of the screen reader order, tab in order. But the first thing we found when looking through our uh, outstanding defects with LivePerson is that our conversational analyst will be responsible for all the tool tips. With most of our carousels being instructional guides, showing step by step how to self-serve in a journey, the image being what the customer would see in an app or e-banking, the tool tip would often be put down the same for the image and the text. So a screen reader, would repeat yourself to the customer for every card on the carousel. That's a problem from an accessibility perspective. So in NatWest chat, we now only actually pay attention to the tooltip on the image. The tooltip for the text is automatically taken from the text. Um, and we also have guidelines in place for analysts in terms of what to write for the imagery itself. The next was how complex and focused the tab order could be when you tab, does it read through the first card, then go to the buttons? Does it move on to the next card seamlessly? If it's the latter, when you reverse tab, does it do the same in reverse, or does it go back to the buttons? So we did a lot of customer testing with people with access needs to determine what the best tabbing order was for that use case. It's a lot more complex when you actually think about it. And finally was the importance of buttons. So in LivePerson, we found the buttons were actually embedded within the cards. This made it difficult for people with access needs and without them, actually, from customer testing uh, to actually notify where the buttons were and navigate the page. Also on mobile devices, there were no buttons at all, which failed accessibility again because some access needs struggled with the gestures of swiping. Next, we had some information from the bank's Banking My Way initiative. This is an initiative where you can record any extra support you need from human agents, 
and the top item being recorded was, please speak slower to me. So we also knew of defects too for screen readers. It would get halfway through the first uh, conversational message and then it would interrupt itself with the next message that came through. So we've implemented the ability for change Cora speed. And unfortunately, we can only do that for Cora. We don't have control over the human agents when we do handoff. So it is just Cora where you can control the speed. Next, we looked at when to apply focus orders. So when we first designed NatWest Chat, we went a bit overkill and we added focus areas everywhere. We wanted to be as informative as possible, and it was only when we completed customer testing with cust uh, testers with access needs that we found actually we were throwing too much information to the customers. So we had to really pare it back and find less is more. So focus areas should only really be used when there's something interactable or an interactable element for the customer to actually click on. What we also learned is actually there's a lot more to accessibility than just the user interface. Actually, conversation design was half the battle. Sometimes, as you can see here, core journeys display too much information in one turn, which can lead to cognitive overload. And equally, sometimes there can be too many clickable options within that turn too, which can also lead to cognitive overload. So we've had a look at our conversation design to really focus on how can we reduce that for our customers so that we don't cause that issue. One of the other features that we added, not necessarily specific to accessibility, was the ability for customers to provide instant thumbs up, thumbs down feedback at a nodal level in the conversation. It allows customers to give feedback at any point we record exactly what point in the conversation then that happens, and it allows our analysts to actually see the true pain points in the journey at the exact moment that they happened. We're also currently looking into discovery on new features too, such as interactive cards showing data for the customers, uh, the fabled date picker, as I mentioned before, <laughs> and an appointment picker too, so they can, uh, customers can make appointments with our video bankers. The important thing here, though, is that we've shifted to the left in terms of accessibility, making sure that we're testing at the same time as designing, not just before we release. NatWest Chat, as an MVP, went live a few weeks ago, actually, for one of our brands, the Isle of Man Bank, on public web. And by Q3, we'll be rolled out across our public web, e-banking, and mobile app channels for all of our brands, from Isle of Man Bank, Ulster Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, to NatWest and NatWest International. But what else are we looking at right now to help with accessibility? First of all, voice. You've probably heard a bit about voice over the last two days. Um, and for a number of use cases too, we know that younger customers communicate through voice notes and our vision is to give core in digital channels a voice. We have completed POCs in the past on smart speakers, and Cora is live for some journeys in our IVR system right now. But giving Cora a voice in our digital channels would be a huge stride forward from an accessibility perspective for us. We're also looking at our sonic branding, knowing that some access needs, having sound effects that indicate something has happened, is useful too. So for example, when you turn a light on or off with a Google device, you'll hear that little ba -dum. That was a terrible, terrible. But for voice to exist in digital, one thing we definitely do need is some form of UI that works seamlessly, and that's where NatWest Chat comes in. I told you I'd come back to it. It's fine. So, yeah, I'm not the only person speaking about ChatGPT today. Uh, but through large language models, we are also currently looking at the possibility of how could we actually alter content based on financial capability. This is use cases for financial education, for our youth segment, for example. But from research in that area, we also know that there are many adults who also struggle when it comes to understanding their finances. So we are going to start discovery into whether or not we could even alter our content and conversations for those in the neurodiverse community 
as an example. And with that, I hope you enjoyed hearing all that we've learned with NatWest Chat along the way. I hope you do have a play with it yourselves soon. And hopefully you'll agree with me when I say, design with accessibility in mind and design for all.